Among the tales of sorrow and of ruin that come down to us from the darkness of those days, there are yet some in which amid weeping there is joy, and under the shadow of death light that endures. And of these histories most fair still in the ears of the elves is the, lay, is the tale of Baron and Luthien. Of their lives was made the lay of Lathian, released from bondage, which is the longest save one of the songs concerning the world of old. But here the tale is told in fewer words and without song. That is the introduction to the tale of Baron and Luthien, which is, as it says, one of the longest parts of the Silmarillion. And this, of course, is the next part of my Silmarillion synopsis series. And when it says that the tale is told shorter here, it is a lot shorter than what the lay would have been if Tolkien had completed it, but my version is going to be really short. So hopefully I don't leave out too much, but to get this to manageable length, I had to really cut down a lot. So let's get started. Our story begins back with the previous chapter with the fall of Fingolfin and the Rune of Beleriand, where basically Morgoth has this huge victory and he drives most of the men uh, out of the north and the men of Beor's house in particular are mostly killed. Barahir is now lord of the people of Beor, and he leads several men basically as outlaws. He's got 12 companions, one of them his own son, Baron, and another one is named Gorlim. Now, previously, Barahir in the Battle of the Sudden Flame had been given the ring of Finrod Felagund for helping save him, and this will become significant. So he's got this ring, and Gorlim at one point, and Gorlim's backstory, by the way, he was off in the war, and then his house apparently had been raided after between when he went off and when he came back, and his wife was gone. So he's really sad about this. He occasionally visits his house, and at some point he goes back, and there's actually a light on in the house. He goes up to it looks in through the window and sees what he thinks is his wife, and he's about to shout when he's basically grabbed from behind and it turns out he has been kidnapped by orcs. So the orcs try to torture him to get information on where Barahir's people are. They're basically hiding up at some high mountain lake where it's really hard to get to, uh, but he won't tell them a thing. And then they kind of promise to, you know, give him some kind of reward, basically, and, and they promise to let him be with his wife. And at that point, he's kind of wavering. They bring him before Sauron, who has been tasked by Morgoth to actually find Barahir and his companions. And Sauron not only confirms this promise, but daunts him with his, his eyes because he's a very powerful Maya. And he finally caves and tells him everything he knows. And then after Sauron gets the information, he basically laughs and says, by the way, you're an idiot. That was a phantom that you saw in your house. Your wife is dead. And to join her, I'm going to let, you know, to let you join her, I'm going to kill you too. So he kills Gorlim. And that's pretty much the end of that. So the orcs do, in fact, go to Barahir's hiding place. Baron, however, is away scouting out some things at Barahir's behest. And while he's away, he has this dream, and he dreams that he's back at the hideout, and he sees Gorlim's ghost basically coming across the water of, of the mountain lake, and then Gorlim, and, and well, the entire scenery is like bloody, and there's carrion birds and things. Gorlim's ghost comes across and tells him basically what happened. So we you get the idea that there's some divine intervention, so to speak, here and basically tells him, you need to hurry up and get back. So Baron does go back to the hiding place as fast as he possibly can, but by the time he gets there, orcs have already killed everybody and made off with, actually, Barahir's hand, which had the ring. Baron follows the orcs, and he comes on them while they're at a camp, and they, of course, they're not worried about anything. They think that they've taken out the only danger. Baron... Uh, sees the orc captain hold up the hand of fin of uh, not Finrod Bar here with the ring of Finrod, and he's boasting about how he killed him or whatever. So Baron just kind of leaps in, kills the orc captain, grabs the hand, and runs out before they can do anything. 
after that, he basically becomes a friend of beads and <laughs> beads, <laughs> birds and animals, beasts. Um, and while he is still trying to kind of hold out there, he can't hold out by himself because the orcs are still trying to kill him. And to avoid being captured, which he fears worse than death, he eventually has to leave Dorthonian. And what he does, he actually crosses the arid Gorgoroth and goes through the area where Ungoliant had done all of her brooding and breeding. And it tells us basically that he's like the only person who ever manages to do this. And it's kind of a miracle that he does. Uh, and it was so horrible that it basically ages him. But he comes across and he manages to reach the, the borders of Doriath. And you may remember a few chapters back when Thingol basically said, I won't have any men in my kingdom, and Melian tells Galadriel in an aside, there will be one from Beor's house who actually does come here because I won't be able to keep him out because his fate is stronger than my girdle. And that's Baron. Baron manages to get through the girdle of Melian, and he comes into Doriath. Now, in Doriath, Baron sees at some point Luthien singing and dancing in the forest. He, of course, has no idea who she is, uh, but we know that she is the daughter of Thingol and Melian, and therefore is half-elf, half-Maya, and the most beautiful thing, you know, in the world. And so Baron kind of almost instantly falls in love with her, but he sees her from a distance, and she kind of leaves, and he doesn't know where she's gone, so he's just kind of wandering around trying to find her, and after this first appearance, he's kind of struck dumb. He can't talk, but in his mind, he's calling her Tenuviel to himself because of her singing, because Tenuviel means nightingales. And you may remember from way back that nightingales were also associated with Melian. Anyway, he ends up seeing her again, and she, he actually ends up kind of getting over the whole not being able to speak thing, and he calls Tenuviel, and she stops and looks back and sees him, he kind of comes up and embraces her, but she kind of slips away and, and kind of disappears again, and he's just so worn out and so stricken by losing her again that he basically swoons and collapses, and just, it's not really clear what state he's in, but it's, it's, it's dark, <laughs> let's put it that way. But then Luthien comes back and puts her hand in his, and it kind of revives him, and they begin to, you know, talk to each other, and, and they take joy in each other's company. Unfortunately for them, uh, Dairon, the minstrel of Thingol, who invented the, the runes that dwarves took such a liking to, he sees them at some point doing what they're doing, wandering around, being happy together, and he tells Thingol about it. Now, Thingol is really mad, because he'd already said he doesn't want some man in his kingdom, and he wasn't ever going to give Luthien to even an older in prince because he prized her that highly. Certainly, he's not going to give her to some man. So he basically threatens that he's going to go out there, capture him, and kill him. Luthien basically says, if you promise not to kill him and you promise not to keep him captive, I'll bring him here, okay? So, because he, he didn't know where to go get him. So he agrees to this, and Luthien does bring Baron before Thingol. Now Thingol, uh, Baron at first is really just kind of overcome with the majesty of the halls of Menegroth and, and Thingol and Melian themselves. And Thingol kind of starts talking down to him and being really, really condescending. Uh, but then Baron kind of takes courage and really gives this eloquent speech basically saying, don't talk down to me. I'm, you know, I've done things that no elf would have dared to do, referring, of course, to his trip through the, the really nasty areas inhabited by Ungoliant and her spawn. Um, and he basically says, and now that I've, I've found something that I don't want to give up, referring, of course, to Luthien, and now Thingol is really incensed. And he basically says, if I hadn't already rashly promised not to kill you, you'd be dead right now for saying that. Melian, on the other hand, is like, don't mess with this guy. His fate leads him far from here, and you don't want to mix yourself up in that. But basically what Thingol does is he says, you know what, if you want to marry my daughter, then what you can do is you can go get a Silmaril from Morgoth's crown. How about that? And Baron, 
Baron kind of plays this off almost as a joke and says, well, if, you know, elf kings want to sell their daughters for jewels, then that's fine with me. Uh, and so he does promise, basically, the next time you see me, I will have a Silmaril in my hand, and he goes off to go try to accomplish this quest. Baron, of course, having no friends, no real aid at all, decides, well, I have the ring that Finrod gave my dad, and so I'm going to go to find Finrod Felagund in Nargothrond and get some help there, because it's really the only thing I've got. So he goes to the, the guarded plain around Nargothrond, because he doesn't know exactly where it is. Nobody does, except the, the people who live there. Um, and he knows he's being watched, so he basically just holds up the ring and is like, I am Baron, son of Bar here, please take me to the king. Uh, and sure enough, some elves come out and they take him to Finrod. Finrod, after hearing Baron's story and what he's wanting to do, realizes that the prophecy he made a while back to Galadriel about making an oath and being free to fulfill it and go into darkness, this is it. And he realizes, I'm going to die. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, he agrees to help Baron, and he makes this known to the people of Nargothrond. Now, Kelogorm and Kurofin, you may remember, are living with him at this point in Nargothrond because they had fled after the Battle of Sudden Flame and take, took refuge there. So... They, being the sons of Feanor and understanding what's going on, they're like, uh, the Silmaril's ours, guys. You can't go after this, and if you do, you're going to be in big trouble. So they also make these eloquent speeches about how if they go and do this, it's going to make Morgoth really mad, and everything's going to go badly for them and everything. And so very few people really are going to side with Finrod at this point. He manages to get ten companions to go with him and Baron but most people are kind of shy of any of this, and it tells us that afterwards, because of the speeches of Kelagorm and Kurofin, they became much more secretive, didn't want to really help people outside Nargothron, and just wanted to protect their own realm by secrecy. But Finrod leaves with these ten companions and Baron, basically puts his brother Orodreth in charge as a steward, but it tells us that Kelagorm and Kurofin are kind of really running things because they have the bigger following at this point. And Finrod and company set off for the north to go try to fulfill the quest. Now the company ends up coming somewhere near to the what used to be Finrod's Tower of Minas Tirith on the island of Tolsirian, far in the north, but which is now inhabited by Sauron, who we've already kind of met in this story. And they find a band of orcs wandering around, they take them and kill them, and they, through elvish arts of Finrod, basically disguise themselves as orcs so that they can hopefully get all the way to Ungban without being noticed. So they do this, and they just kind of try to skirt past, you know, the, the Minas Tirith, which is now Tolan Gaurhoth. But Sauron sees them from afar, and he's like, they're not stopping to report. Something's fishy here. So he sends some other people to go out and grab them, bring them in and starts to question them and the next thing you know you have a magical duel between Sauron and Finrod who are basically singing magic. Sauron is trying to strip away their disguise. Finrod is trying to prevent that. Sauron ultimately wins out and finds out, oh, elves and men, how about that? But he can't determine who exactly they are so he doesn't realize he's got Finrod and he doesn't realize he has Baron uh, so he basically just puts them all in a dungeon and says, I'm going to kill you one by one until one of you tells me what's going on here. He suspects, based on the power that Finrod shows, that Finrod is really the ringleader here, and so he's trying to save him for last. Uh, but one by one, a wolf comes down into the dungeon and eats one of them. But they all remain faithful. Meanwhile, Luthien in Doriath kind of has this premonition that something has gone wrong and she plans to go and try to help Baron. Now she ends up telling Dairon this, and Dairon betrays her plan to Thingol, who then says, all right, you're not going anywhere. He basically has a tree house built for her in the tallest tree in Doriath, and puts her up there with a guard at the ground. Basically, you know, he's not willing to keep her underground, but he doesn't want her to get any, go anywhere either. So he builds this tree house prison essentially, where she can still see the sun and things, but not really escape. So he does that. Melian the whole time is 
I mean, from kind of start to finish, <laughs> every time it tells us what's going on, she's kind of like, you're really messing up here. But anyway, while Luthien is up in this treehouse, she uses her own magic to really grow her hair long in a short amount of time. Out of it, she makes a cloak, which basically can put people to sleep. And she also uses the rest of her hair as a rope to climb down to the bottom where she just puts the guards to sleep and then she runs off. Now, in trying to leave Doriath, she ends up running into, of all people, Kelegorm and Kurifin. Sauron had been sending wolves further south after the encounter with Finrod, trying to find out if he could what was going on, and they were out hunting these wolves, specifically with a dog from Valinor. Calling him a dog sounds really, really poor. I should just call him the Hound. Huon. And Huon was a hound given by Orome, the Vala, to Kelegorm, uh, back when Kelegorm was friendly with the Valar, and this Who on the Hound is prophesied basically to never die except when killed by the greatest werewolf ever to walk, or maybe it's just greatest wolf ever to walk Middle Earth. Um, but that is an interesting premonition for way later in the story. So they run into her, and basically they kind of stop her and she reveals herself, hoping to get some help for her mission. And Kelgorm, unfortunately, knowing who she is and seeing her beauty uncloaked, she's, he's like, hmm, I'd kind of like to have her for my wife. So he pretends that he's going to help her, and they take her back to Nargothrond, and there they just basically keep her prisoner because they haven't really told her anything that they know about Baron or anything, even though they know plenty. So they're keeping her prisoner, and they send messages back to Thingol and Doriath, basically saying, I want to marry your daughter. And basically you get the idea that their plan is to try to eventually gain power over all the kingdoms in Middle-earth, such that they end up being kind of the sole leaders of everybody, at which point then they will, you know, try to make plans to either attack Morgoth or whatever they want to do. Huon, however, is capable of understanding human speech, and it tells us that he speaks three times. And he doesn't like what Kelegorm and Kurufin are doing, so he goes to uh, Luthien, where she's being held, and speaks for the first time, basically telling her, here's the plan, here's what we're going to do. He helps her break out, uh, and he takes her to the island where Sauron is holding Baron and Finrod. And at this point, you know, by, by that point, there's really only Finrod and Baron left. Another wolf comes down, planning to eat Baron, because as I mentioned, Sauron is trying to keep Finrod for last because he thinks he's the real key. Um, but Finrod, seeing that Baron is about to die, puts forth all of his strength and you know gets free of his chains and fights the werewolf and kills it. But unfortunately, he also dies. Um, and it, well, it's really horrible for Baron because now he's hopeless. He thinks all is doomed. But Luthien and Baron come to the island shortly after this, and Sauron is aware of what's going on. Well, he knows that Luthien's there anyway, because she she's singing, and Baron actually hears it and tries to answer. That should ring bells, by the way. Uh, but anyway, Sauron recognizes who she is, and he's like, Ooh, Morgoth really wants her, so I should capture her, and then I'll be rewarded. So he sends out a wolf to go get her. But the wolf gets killed by Huon, of course, because Huon is really, really, you know, a powerful, powerful hound. So at first, Sauron doesn't seem to realize what's happening. He sends more wolves out, and they just each keep getting killed. He finally sends out this one called Draugluin, who is kind of like the father of werewolves. And he manages to survive just long enough to come back to Sauron and say, it's Huon, and then he dies. Uh, Sauron is like, hmm. I'm aware of this prophecy that only the greatest wolf that ever walks Middle-earth will kill him. I'll turn myself into the greatest wolf and go kill him. Uh, so he turns himself into a wolf, and he goes out, and he's the terror that precedes him is so great that Huon just kind of jumps aside, and Sauron pounces on Luthien, who kind of tries to cast her cloak over him, and it stuns him just a little bit, and then Huon pounces, and they start to fight. And... Fortunately, Sauron is not the greatest wolf ever to walk Middle-earth, and so Huon actually gets the upper hand and has him by the throat. Sauron actually tries to change into a bunch of different animals to try to escape, and it doesn't work. So Luthien basically tells him, 
you're trapped. What you're going to do is you're going to give over the mastery of the tower to me, or you can be killed by Huon and your worthless little spirit can fly back to Morgoth and be really embarrassed. Uh, so Sauron does, in fact, yield the mastery of the tower to Luthien, and he is let go, and he flies from there as a as a bat, basically off to the woods, and there makes things even nastier than they already were. So Luthien, with the power that she has kind of been vested through Sauron, basically destroys the tower. And it turns out there's actually a lot of prisoners in there that come out and last of all, they find Baron, who is kind of swooned, basically fearing that, you know, he's never going to get out. And they also, of course, find the body of Finrod Felagund. Finrod, they bury on the island, and it tells us that his grave remains inviolate, but that his spirit goes back, of course, to the halls of Mondos, and now he walks with Finarf and his father back in Valinor. After this, Huon returns to Kelagorm because he is faithful to him as a master, even if he doesn't particularly like what he's doing. Uh, very dog-like quality, I suppose. And also a lot of the prisoners from uh, Sauron's Tower also return to Nargothrond. And there they basically tell what happened, and all the nastiness that Kelagorm and Kurufin have been up to kind of comes to light, and people are suddenly like, that's not cool, guys. and they almost kill him, but Orodreth basically says, no, we're not going to go that far because then we're probably just going to end up even worse messed up with their oath and everything else. But he does banish them. And not even their own people will go with them because they're all like, these guys are a piece of work. So Kelagorm and Kurufin leave Nargothrond and they head north because they're going to try to go north and then east to rejoin the Sons of Feanor elsewhere. Meanwhile, Baron and Luthien are kind of wandering around. Baron is kind of being healed by Luthien because he's been, you know, down in this dungeon for so long. And as they're wandering, Kelagorm and Kurufin, of all things, come across them. Now, Kelagorm rides down on Baron and tries to kill him, while Kurufin rides up to Luthien and grabs her up onto his saddle. Baron avoids Kelagorm and it tells us that he jumps straight from the ground onto Kurufin's saddle, and it's even called the Leap of Baron because it's like, oh my gosh, nobody can jump that high. Uh, but he jumps onto the saddle behind Kurufin and throws both him and him, himself and Kurufin to the ground. Luthien is also knocked to the ground, and while he's dealing with Kurufin, Kelamukorm is coming up from behind about to spear him, but Huon comes in between and prevents Kelagorm from doing this. And after this, Huon's totally done with Kelagorm. He's like, I'm not sticking with you anymore. Luthien tells Baron, don't kill Kurufin, but he does strip him of all his gear, including a knife named Angris, Angrist, which literally just means iron cleaver. And uh, it was made by Telkar in Nogrod, who was the same person, by the way, who forged Narsil. Um... So he takes this knife, which basically it's called that because it's really good at cutting iron, and he takes a bunch of his other gear, and they take uh, the horse that Kurufin had and basically said, you can walk. Uh, Kelagorm and Kurufin share the one horse that's left, and while they're leaving, Kurufin turns around and shoots his bow at Luthien. Huon jumps up and catches the arrow, but Kurufin shoots a second arrow, which Baron steps in front of Luthien to take it in his chest, and then the two brothers ride off. So now Luthien has to heal Baron of this wound, which is really nasty, and apparently it takes some deal of time to do this. After Luthien manages to heal Baron, they kind of wander into the outskirts of Doriath again, and there Baron basically decides... Luthien is safe. I'm going to go off alone and finish this quest by myself because I don't want to endanger her. So he starts getting further north and manages to get onto the borders of the Anthalglith, which is the what used to be the Ardgallan, the really big green plain that was scorched by the, the fire that Morgoth loosed in the Sudden Flame battle. And when he gets there, Luthien and Huon catch up. Huon basically let Luthien ride on him like a steed. And Baron tries to argue and says, don't do this, I'm going to do this by myself. But Huon, speaking for the second time, basically tells him, you can't save Luthien at this point. Because of her love for you, she is more or less 
doomed to die, you can either let her go with you, or you can let her wither in Doriath. That's pretty much your options. So Baron gives in. Uh, Huon, again, helps them out, and he finds a bat skin, or vampire skin. It's a vampire bat skin of a uh, one of the messengers of Sauron. And he also gets the, the Wolfheim of Draugluin, and he uses that to disguise Baron and Luthien. Luthien is the bat and Baron as the wolf, and thus disguised, they set off for the gates of Angband. Huon won't will go with them, though, but he does kind of forebode that whatever they meet at the gate there, he may eventually meet too, and he says that it may yet be that we all three meet again in Doriath. Morgoth, hearing of all the goings-on that Huon has had a part in, decided that he was going to raise the greatest wolf ever to walk Middle-earth. So he took one of the whelps of Draugluin, you know, and basically raised it as his own and through means unknown, which partially involved magic, I'm sure, raised Karkaroth, which is the Red Maw, who is, in fact, the greatest wolf ever known, and set him as a guard at the gates of Angban. Baron and Luthien come to the gates, and they're like, oh, we didn't know about this. Uh, and so they're walking up, and Karkaroth, smelling them, is like, uh, something's not right here. But Luthien comes up and basically throws her cloak over his face, and he goes, oh, like everybody else. And so they sneak down into the halls of Morgoth. And they come, in fact, to his throne room, where they're both kind of terrified because there's just a bunch of bad people in there. Baron kind of slinks around and sits under Morgoth's throne, and Morgoth is looking at Luthien, who is at first still disguised, of course, and he's like, something's, something's weird here. Uh, Luthien casts off her disguise and basically declares herself openly and offers to sing for him as if she was a minstrel, and Morgoth is kind of sitting in his head, oh, I like this, and he's having some really dark dark thoughts. Uh, you can imagine what those are for yourself, because that's what Tolkien leaves us to do. Uh, but anyway, while he's doing this, she is kind of singing and dancing around, and then suddenly she kind of just leaves his sight while he's not paying a whole lot of attention, and she starts singing a song that starts to make everybody in the room drowsy, and Morgoth is starting to feel like the weight of the crown that holds the Silmarils is just this huge weight, and he starts to bend forward, and then suddenly out of nowhere, Luthien comes up and throws her cloak over his face, and he just crashes to the ground. Now she goes and wakes up Baron, and Baron takes Angrist and starts to cut a Silmaril out of the, the crown, and he gets one Silmaril, and he suddenly thinks, wait a minute, why don't I just take all three of them? And so he starts to cut a second one, but the knife snaps while he's doing it, and a shard goes over and hits the cheek of Morgoth, who's just laying on the floor asleep, and he groans, and suddenly Baron and Luthien are like, oh my gosh, we're about to really catch it. So they start running for the entrance while everybody else is kind of slowly starting to wake up, but by the time they get back up to the gates, Karkaroth has already woken back up, and he kind of knows what's up, so he's waiting for them, and as they get close to the gate, he kind of pounces, Luthien, you know, has kind of spent a lot of her own magic doing what she did to Morgoth, and so she's not really ready to put Karkaroth asleep again, so Baron kind of steps forward, puts the Silmaril out, and says, this thing will burn you. Um, you may remember from way back that when they were hallowed by Varda, it was said that, you know, no flesh unclean or evil or mortal, but Baron seems to be an exception to that. It says that it suffers his touch, uh, can stand the touch of the Silmaril, and so Barrett is just kind of pointing out, this will, you know, literally burn your flesh, but Karkaroth just reaches and bites off his hand, and, you know, takes the Silmaril with it, and the Silmaril does, in fact, burn his innards, and it's so agonizing that he just goes on this rampage, you know, running all over Beleriand, causing all kinds of destruction. Baron is really wounded at this point, Luthien, you know, tends to him, uh, and but they're, you know, sitting on the gates of Angban, but luckily a couple of eagles come by, they pick them up, and they fly them over the hidden, hidden city of Gondolin, so Luthien kind of sees that, but Baron's passed out, uh, and they drop them off in the woods near Doriath again. Luthien continues to tend Baron, but his wound is poisoned because the venom 
there was venom in the, the fangs of Karkaroth, and so for a long time he's basically like in a coma, but Huon meets up and helps Luthien tend him, and eventually he finally wakes up, and they, you know, are, have joy again, at least for a little while. And after this, Baron names himself Erkamion, which means the one-handed. Luthien, at this point, would have been content to just wander in the wild with Baron, but Baron couldn't really stand the thought of that, so he said, we're going to go to Thingol, and we're going to finish this thing. So, in the meantime, while they had been gone, everything in Thingol, in Thingol's realm had gone kind of badly. Nobody was happy because uh, Luthien had left. Dairon, particularly, who had, you know, made lots of music about her and kind of loved her in his own right, went off in search of her and never was seen again. And you, it tells us that he probably wandered off into the east and we don't know what becomes of him eventually. Uh, but things ba basically were just not going well. And there's also the threat of Karkaroth now who has been wandering around and coming near to Doriath and its borders. Baron and Luthien come before Thingol. Thingol is basically really unhappy with Baron because he blames him for all the bad things that have happened since he left. And he basically says, so where's my Silmaril? And Baron says, well, as promised, I'm holding it in my hand. And he says, well, where is it? And well, he shows him his left hand, opens it, it's empty. And then he shows the stump of his other arm, or maybe I'm getting right and left mixed up, but point remains. You know, he shows him the one hand that's empty, and then he shows him the, the stump. And at that point, it says that Thingol kind of calms down, and he's like, oh, so what happened here? And Baron and Luthien then tell him the whole story. After this, Thingol basically agrees, okay, I'm sorry for being such a jerk. I will let Luthien marry you. But Karkaroth has been encroaching on Doriath, and the power of the Silmaril has let him get through the girdle of Melian. And Baron, hearing about this, realizes that his quest is not yet complete. And so they decide, we're going to go on a wolf hunt. So Thingol, Baron, and a whole bunch of others, including Mablung, who is the chief captain of Thingol's army, and Beleg Strongbow, who is the chief march warden, are all going to be in on this hunt. And they set out, and they are looking for him. They kind of hear him off in the distance, and so they go to where they know but he must be. He's at this uh, pool where he's presumably basically gulping down water, trying to ease the pain of the burning. Uh, but Karkaroth kind of realizes they're coming, sees him coming, and he hides himself into this, you know, cane, like a, I guess, a, a, I forget the word it uses, but basically a, a really thick undergrowth where they're not going to be able to get him. So they just basically set up a watch to wait for him to come out. Uh, and Huon, who is never one to pass up a good fight, I guess, decides he's going to go in there alone and get him out. Karkaroth avoids him, though comes out, leaps at Thingol, Baron pushes him away, and, you know, puts himself in between Karkaroth and Thingol, takes a bite in the chest, and then Huon and Karkaroth start fighting, and they're having just the biggest canine beatdown of all time. Thingol, meanwhile, goes over to Baron and is like, are you okay? Huon does manage to kill Karkaroth, but Karkaroth's venom also is killing him, because he is really wounded, and speaking for the third and final time, he tells Baron fell farewell. Mobloom comes up to the dead body of Karkaroth, takes a knife, cuts open his innards, and finds there Baron's hand holding the Silmaril. But when he reaches for it, the hand just kind of dissolves, leaving only the Silmaril. He takes it, give it, gives it to Baron in his good hand, and Baron then gives it to Thingol, completing his quest. They take Baron back to Menegroth, where Luthien had been having some premonitions again, and she comes out to meet them, and Baron does get to look at Luthien again before he finally dies, and she tells him, wait for me in the halls across the sea. Uh, so he dies, his spirit goes to the halls of Mondos, and his spirit does in fact tarry there. We're not told if this is unusual necessarily, but it's kind of implied. Luthien eventually just dies of sorrow. Her spirit then goes to the halls of Mondos, and she sits before the, the seat of Mondos and basically sings the most beautiful, the most sad song ever sung, 
about you know the sorrows of men and elves and basically mondos who has never before and never afterward will be moved by pity is moved by pity and as a result you know he he allows barren spirit to come and meet with luthians but he says i can't change your fates so he goes to monway and tells Monwe about all this. Monwe kind of looks inside himself, trying to figure out what, you know, Eru Iluvatar would have him do. And he finally comes up with, with the answer. And he basically tells Luthien, "Look, you can either, because of what you've done, you can, you know, be returned to your your bodily form here in Valinor and live forever in bliss, or, and if you do that, you'll be separated from Baron forever, or you can go back to Middle Earth with Baron." But you'll be mortal and there will be no guarantees. This doom she chose, forsaking the blessed realm and putting aside all claim to kinship with those that dwell there. And thus whatever grief might lie in wait, the fates of Baron and Luthien might be joined and their paths lead together beyond the confines of the world. So it was that alone of the Eldalier she has died indeed and left the world long ago. Yet in her choice the two kindreds have been joined and she is the forerunner of many in whom the Eldar see yet, though all the world has changed, likeness of Luthien the Beloved, whom they have lost. So that is a great tragedy, of course, for the elves, but it is a great joy for Baron and Luthien to be able to live together and, and have their fates not sundered. And that is the end of, of Baron and Luthien. So that was the end of that chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope I covered enough of it to give you a good feel, but you really really have to read the whole thing for yourself. It's really good stuff. The only sad part is he doesn't, he never, Tolkien never gave full novel-length treatment to the Baron and Luthien story the way that he did with the Children of Hurin. Uh, you may know that the Children of Hurin is a standalone book on its own based on the Of Turin to Rumbar chapter, which comes a little bit later than this. At any rate, this is one you should definitely read for yourself. It's not novel-like but if you have a copy of the Silmarillion, it is definitely worth reading, even if you read only this chapter alone. That being said, uh, if you did enjoy the video, please do give it a thumbs up, share it around. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter and get occasional Tolkien trivia, you can find me at JRRT Lore. You can, of course, also subscribe to the channel here. Don't forget to hit that bell icon. You can support the channel over here, and you can find two of my previous videos here. Until next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namadie.